Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Welcome. My name's Taya, and I'll be leading us through our service today. Whether you're new to our community, this online experience, or you've worshipped with us many times before, I want you to know that we're really glad that you're here. We want to encourage you to worship together with others, and we have community groups meeting together virtually as we worship today. If you're not in a group, we also have a public group you can join, and our host will share a link in the chat window. As we worship together today, there will be words in bold on the screen that we invite you to say along with us. We recognize it can feel weird to speak or sing in our rooms on our own, but I want to invite you to push through the awkwardness as we worship God together with word and song. Let's prepare our hearts to worship together. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God who was, and who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. Alleluia. Will you sing with us? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount. Fix upon it, mounts of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, given by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Great a debtor, I'm really I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Oh, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and see. For thy courts above, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Your promises remain. You give justice to the weak. You care for the widow and orphan. Forever, Lord, you reign. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord, what peace 
What peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. Blinded eyes to see and cherish those who seek your fame. Your faithful love endures. You came to let the slave go free. You caused the sinner to sing praise. And here we are secure. What joy! What joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Forever we will sing Alleluia Praises to the King Alleluia Forever we will sing Alleluia Praises to the King What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord What peace what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. Is Him alone. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the chance to gather as your people, even as we are physically apart. We thank you that we are united by your spirit. We thank you for the many gifts that we enjoy, and we pray for uh, your continued goodness in our lives and in the life of the world, especially at this difficult time. We pray that you would bless us as we worship you, as we hear from your word, and as we seek uh, to learn once again how to rejoice in the salvation that you have won for us in Christ. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship, we'll move into a time of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. I invite you to take a physical posture that reflects a posture of humility in your heart. You might sit or kneel. Together, let's open our hearts before God, turn away from our sin, and turn to Christ. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take comfort in these words from the Apostle Paul. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Knowing that Jesus lifts us up out of our sin, receive these words of assurance. 
Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the gospel is good news of great joy. Let's rejoice together. All the earth shout and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One. Alleluia. Our scripture reading today is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 13, to chapter 10, verse 20. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise, heard in quiet, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, so he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it's charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be. And who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, wherever you are and whatever time it may be, let me welcome you once again to St. Pete's. My name's Alistair. I'm the lead pastor of this community. And before we jump into the text, let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks that we can be gathered together virtually. That although we are separated as a body right now, we are still united in Christ. And we're still together by the power of your spirit. So as we open your word, we ask that you'd apply it to our minds, that we not grow shallow, that you'd apply it to our hearts, that we not grow cold, and that you'd apply it to our feet, that we'd not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. We pray all of these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our passage today begins with a story that greatly impressed the preacher. He wrote, there was once a small city with only a few people in it. And a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. 
Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. So when you're a small city with only a few people, and you're outmatched and outnumbered and surrounded by the powers of an empire, what do you do? Now, the normal course of action is to turn to your council, to turn to your inner circle, your strategists, your military advisors, your wise men and sages. If you were in the realm of Middle Earth, you would call upon Gandalf. Uh, This is where you would expect to find wisdom, but in this story, wisdom isn't found where you would expect to find it. Wisdom's not discerned in the inner circle, in the halls of power and status. Instead, it's the wisdom of a poor, wise man that saves the city. Keep in mind that in the era of Ecclesiastes, a common assumption was that if you were poor, you couldn't be wise. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this situation. So in a paradigm-rattling turn of events, wisdom is found in the person, perhaps, who looked abandoned, dressed in rags, who had little prestige, who on any given, given day was overlooked, unimpressive, unimportant, a symbol of failure, not success. Wisdom wasn't found in power and status, but in weakness, not high up in the world, of the influencers, but in a voice from below. And we don't know what counsel this poor man offered. We don't know if he helped them negotiate a compromise or a surrender or a unique military strategy to win the day. The preacher leaves out, of, out these details because the point is that have, after having saved the city, shortly after, nobody remembered that man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. And this is what the preacher presses onto us in this passage. Wisdom has the power to save, and we might even turn to wisdom for a time, only to turn away from it down the road. We can treat wisdom like a first aid kit rather than a way of being, a way of life. The preacher goes on to say in chapter 10, verse 2, the heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. So keeping in mind that the heart in the Hebraic imagination is not just about our emotions, but our whole being, we can hear the preacher saying that there's a way of being that travels down this path of foolishness, and there's a way of being that travels down the path of wisdom. But what we must consider is why. Why do we travel down the path of wisdom for a short period of time only to turn aside to the path of foolishness? And when this happens, what's actually taking place within us? So first, let's consider the heart that travels down the path of foolishness, and then we'll consider the heart that travels down the path of wisdom. So first, the heart that travels down the path of foolishness. In the story, once the crisis passes and the city is safe and secure once more, the poor man's forgotten and wisdom is disregarded. And the city went back to a normal And which meant there was no place within the courts of power for someone who was an outsider, for someone who was poor, for someone who needed to be disregarded. And so the status quo went back to being the status quo. He didn't have a part. He no longer had any purpose, any place to serve within the city. But this shows that wisdom is often sought out as a temporary measure We'll use wisdom to bandage up a wound, to be a salve to our pain, to be a solution to the problem, only later to disregard it once the problem passes. You see, it's not unusual to seek out wisdom when it's needed, but this isn't always the baseline of our hearts, is it? And when this happens, it shows that our hearts are inclined toward foolishness. The preacher writes in chapter 10, verse 1, As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. We could say that folly is the axe body spray of perfumes. One scholar says a better translation is actually more precious than wisdom and honor 
is a little folly. And this gets us closer to understanding why it is we can disregard wisdom, why we can turn away to the path of foolishness. Because if we can have our way, we're going to choose a little folly over wisdom and honor. In our heart of hearts, it's because we think a little folly won't be all that harmful. But a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. That's what the preacher tells us. And this is how we begin to ultimately disregard wisdom. And so to make his point, the preacher fills an entire chapter with Proverbs. And we don't have time to examine every proverb in chapter 9, verses 17 through chapter 10, verses 20. But let's try to just draw a sketch of the fool according to these verses. So the fool, they shout and boast and intentionally and unintentionally, they destroy good. Even just a little bit of foolishness, we told, we're told, outweighs and thwarts wisdom. You know, the fool lacks sense, and from the outside looking in, their ways and choices are observably stupid. The fool honors the wrong sort of person. They surround themselves with others like them rather than with the wise. They engulf themselves in groupthink. They are consumed by their own words, and their words are endless, and they begin with foolishness but end in madness. They are lazy and idle, and often the fool reviles and curses and slanders. They tear down rather than build up. They divide rather than unite. Now, all of this adds up to much more than a little folly. It's the path of utter foolishness, and the preacher minces no words. This way of being is observably stupid. And when we take in this whole picture, of course, we want to distance ourselves from it because it does look pretty stupid. This might be an accurate description of someone, but not us. You might even think it sounds like someone you know, but not yourself. But I doubt very many people are aware that they're on the path of foolishness. Fools are not the same as a court jester who knows that their role is to be the butt of the joke. Most fools likely think they're not foolish. They may even consider themselves wise, and this misdiagnosis can afflict your everyday person and even your kings. And that's a point the preacher wants us to take home. We can be unaware that we are walking down the path of foolishness, and it doesn't matter who we are. It can afflict everybody. Because at the end of the day, we think that we've only chosen a little folly. Now, it's important we grasp this. The preacher isn't asking whether we're wholesale fools or not. What he is asking is, isn't this true? That we like to have just a little bit of folly in our lives. Not all the foolishness, just some, a harmless amount, or at least what appears to be a harmless amount. But if you're not tracking with me yet, if you don't think you choose a little folly, let's reduce the fool down to two qualities from these Proverbs, just two qualities of foolishness that might make us see our own lives in a different light. The fool, the everyday ordinary fool, is lost and verbose. These are the two qualities. They're lost and verbose. First, the fool is lost. Look at verse 3. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everyone how stupid they are. And verse 15, the toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. The fool doesn't know where they're going. And even if they think they know where they're going, they don't realize that the end destination will be very different than what they've imagined. For example, they might think they're heading down the path toward financial success, but very clearly be heading toward financial ruin. They might think they're on their way to acclaim, but end up in humiliation. You see, the fool goes about doing whatever is right in their own eyes, but they lack the sense to think about where it leads. They never look up and allow wisdom to show them the folly of the path that they've taken. You see, we may be a little more foolish than we realize because doing what is right in our own eyes 
is so deeply ingrained in our way of life at this time and this place. You see, our cultural moment is heavily influenced by postmodernism. We're bombarded with this message that the only truth is the truth that you believe. There's no universal or objective truth out there to be discovered or discerned. The only right is what is right for you. It's all subjective. It's all a matter of opinion, a matter of interpretation. And at the end of the day, you must be true to you. And this is the cultural baseline. And it's become such the standard that we might not even be aware we're living this way. Or if we are, we might not even see what the problem is. So let me just list a few ways that we can live out doing whatever is right in our own eyes. When you have to make a life decision, do you make it on your own? Or if you've made up your mind about what you do and want to get advice, do you only seek out people that you know are going to affirm the decision you've already made? When it comes to our own lifestyle choices, are they based off of extravagance and indulgence? The way you spend your money and your time, if you stepped back and looked at it, what's it invested in? Who's it centered around? Who's making the decisions about how you make your money, what you do with your money, and how you use your time? You see, usually in these instances, we're doing what's right in our own eyes. We can even envision God in such a way that he never disagrees with us. He always shares our opinion. And if we're doing this, we're just doing what's right in our own eyes. But how is doing what's right in our own eyes a little bit of folly? Well, the answer is that when we do what's right in our own eyes, we either have to disregard what's right in God's eyes, or assume we're doing what's right in God's eyes, or say we're doing what's right in God's eyes, but not be aware that what we're doing is actually not approved in God's eyes. See, there's a significant difference between doing what is right in our own eyes and doing what is pleasing to the Lord's eyes. Wisdom sees this, but folly doesn't. And doing what is right in our own eyes is a refrain from the book of Judges. And I've chosen it because it's the posture of our heart that convinces us that we'll find our own happiness and flourishing so long as we're true to ourselves. But ultimately, when we live this way, it leads us to emptiness and isolation and corruption and violation and bankruptcy. We see this time and time again in the book of Judges. This is the posture of the heart that gets us lost on the path of foolishness. But second, the fool is also verbose. As we read in verses 12 through 14, fools are consumed by their own lips. And at the beginning of their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness. And fools multiply words. Now, if I'm wise, this point should be of fewer words. So how are we prone today to be verbose like the fool? We are a generation of information over wisdom. We're more inclined to ask, have you heard the latest, than to ask, what are you discerning in life? The accumulation of much knowledge and information to be well informed is more a virtue than to be wise. And we don't say this explicitly, of course, but it's how we live. Because information, it's instant and it's quick and it's often echoed and repeated without any discernment. We just parrot what we've heard and we consume in abundance. We can follow sound bites, we can articulate the contours of a celebrity's life. And we might even be able to articulate the most important social matters of the moment. But the truth is we have never known so much and understood so little. We can be informed, but not wise. And we talk and we talk and we talk about what we know. We share and post and retweet and speak. But it's just multiplying words. And in the end, this is foolishness. If we're well informed and informing others, but our own lives go unchanged. Because wisdom isn't just knowing a lot of information. It's knowing how to apply knowledge to a given situation and to live by it. The fool is lost and verbose. 
The fool does what is right in their own eyes and mistakes information for wisdom. And we're on the path of the fool if we choose just a little folly over wisdom. And I believe we're all prone to this because I know, at least for myself, I'm prone to this. So we've thought about how our hearts can be inclined to the path of foolishness. But now let's move toward the path of wisdom. How do our hearts move in that direction? Our passage began with a story of wisdom, which greatly impressed the preacher. And I know of another story about wisdom, and I think this story would also greatly impress the preacher were he alive today. It's the story of the monks of Tiberine. There were eight Trappist monks at Our Lady of the Atlas Monastery in Algeria, and they lived during Algeria's horrific civil war in the 1990s. And in the face of terrible violence, violence which threatened their very lives, The question they faced as a community was, should we stay or should we go? And they dealt with this question together as a community, as a family, and they were trying to discern not what's right in our eyes, but what's pleasing to the Lord's eyes. And as they sought wisdom, as they tried to discern, they weren't initially in agreement about what they should do because what they were really wrestling with was what would their actions communicate to their predominantly Muslim neighbors? How would they demonstrate Christ's love toward their community? And they knew staying would be incredibly dangerous, and yet wisdom led them to stay. So this little monastery of a few people listened to wisdom, and like the parable at the beginning of our passage, they find themselves surrounded Their compound was besieged, and they were kidnapped by 20 armed men, and then they were beheaded. The last testament of one of the monks, Christian de Serge, was later discovered. And this is what he wrote. If it should happen one day that I become a victim of the terrorism, which now seems ready to encompass all the foreigners living in Algeria, I would like my community, my church, my family, to remember that my life was given to God and to this country. I asked them to accept that the one master of all life was not a stranger to this brutal departure. I asked them to pray for me, for how could I be found worthy of such an offering? Let me ask you, does this sound like wisdom to you? When you hear this story, doesn't part of you want to disregard the wisdom of the monks? Unlike the poor man in the preacher's story, the monk's wisdom didn't rescue the city or their lives. So how is this wisdom? It looks a lot more like foolishness, don't you think? The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is is stronger than human strength. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. The monks knew that wisdom appeared in Christ crucified. And this isn't where we expect to find wisdom. Jesus, by all appearances, looked abandoned. He was stripped of his garments. He had lived simply with little prestige, and his death was a symbol of failure and not success. But like the poor man in the preacher's story, wisdom isn't always found in power and status. It can be found in weakness and in a voice from below, crying from two crooked beams of a cross. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Jesus has become for us wisdom from God. The way of Christ's self-sacrificial love is greater than all the wisdom of every, every philosophy and religion put together and multiplied. Yes, sometimes wisdom means a city is saved and delivered, And sometimes wisdom means that a life is given for the sake of love. You see, because our hearts are prone 
to desire a little folly, we're also prone to treat wisdom as a first aid kit. We'll seek out wisdom when the sirens and alarms are blaring, when we face a crisis or major dilemma or decision. But the path of wisdom is not a first aid kit. It's a way of being, a way of life, an allegiance to the way of the cross, the way of Jesus, who is our wisdom. So the question is, what needs to happen in our hearts so that we find this path of wisdom? First, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is what we read in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, in some instances throughout Scripture, when people encounter the presence of God, they literally fall down and crumble in fear. That can sometimes be the experience of God. But in this instance, this isn't about the emotion of fear before the Lord. Rather, in this case, it's much more about knowing our place before God. If we fear God, it means we choose to acknowledge how prone we are to a little bit of folly, how often we are inclined to do what is right in our own eyes. And a fear of the Lord is an acknowledgement that our thoughts are not one and the same with God's thoughts, that our ways are not the same as God's ways, and that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so God's ways are higher than our own ways, so God's thoughts are higher than our own thoughts. And so if we choose the wisdom of fearing the Lord, it means we'll also choose a different type of foolishness. Instead of a little bit of folly, we'll choose the foolishness and weakness of God because that is his power at work in the cross of Christ to reconcile and restore everything to himself. The monks clearly feared the Lord. Their allegiance was the way of the cross. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, where is our allegiance? In your heart of hearts, do you come to God because you think God will improve your life? Do you see God more as an add-on, an occasional thought? Or do you come to God because your allegiance is to him and his ways, no matter where they may lead or how costly they might be? Second, the path of wisdom means we don't follow the ways of our culture by doing what's right in our own eyes. The way of wisdom seeks to do what is pleasing in the eyes of God. And so we have to become familiar with how God has revealed himself in Christ and throughout all of Scripture. And we discern wisdom, not on our own, not in isolation, but like the monks in the setting of a community. Wisdom is communally discerned as we listen to God's word and spirit and ask Jesus to guide and lead us. Third, the path of wisdom isn't just acquiring more and more information or knowing a lot. Wisdom is getting after the heart of God and being empowered to walk in the ways of God, which often looks like sacrificial love for the good of others. And it's not always instant and quick, And that's hard for us in this moment. Wisdom requires patience and discernment and a willingness to slow down and learn and listen to our community, to the spirit, to the word. Wisdom isn't on demand and it's not easily consumed like Instagram. It requires patience. Essentially, wisdom for any follower of Jesus is this question. Where is Jesus leading us? Because Jesus Christ is our wisdom. He knows what is right and what is true and what is the best course of action in any given moment. And often the way of wisdom requires sacrifice, a willingness to lay down our preferences and comfort and allegiances and to choose the way of the cross by choosing to count others as more significant than ourselves. And so as we endure a pandemic of unprecedented scale, and as each day the news is filled with reports of violence and racism and death, we're especially aware that we need wisdom. But these disruptions to our ordinary are actually just pulling us into reality as it really is. And we can be tempted to seek wisdom out right now as a first aid kit, as a quick solution. 
But what we actually need is the way of wisdom to engage the world as it really is, not just now, but for the whole remainder of our lives. And so what does it look like for us to choose the path of wisdom at a time such as this? And for a church that's predominantly Caucasian, such as St. Peter's Fireside, what does wisdom look like for us? And I know that it's unusual for me to speak to one specific ethnic group of our church, but it's necessary. And while I believe this can benefit all of us, right now I want Caucasian members of our church to listen up. Wisdom right now means listening and learning and amplifying. Listening, learning, and amplifying. First, listen to what scripture says about race. If you don't know where to start, read Ephesians chapter 2 again and again and again. Memorize it. God has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility between ethnic groups. And we have a part to play in this. Reforming our own lives and deconstructing systemic and systematic racism. Because currently we benefit from a society that has a history of being built by what is right in the eyes of white people. And as we listen to God, we also listen to people of color. Listen to them and challenge yourself to believe them. Can you hear their cries for justice? Do you listen to their words and their experiences? Or do you back away and try to come up with another explanation? Listen to the experts. Buy some books and read them and digest them and wrestle with them and make up for what your formation throughout school lacked. Start with Rediscipling the White Church by David Swanson and then read Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And as I read this week, I was moved by this quote. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism where you find it, including in yourself, and it's the only way forward. So if we want to join God in tearing down the dividing wall of hostility, it's not enough to not be racist. We must be anti-racism. Do you feel content? with the way the world is as you hear these cries for justice? Or are you willing to find a way forward? You see, to be not racist is to say, well, I've done enough. But to be anti-racist is to say there is more to be done and I can do more. I also want to say, if we listen, we'll hear wisdom telling us not to reach out to people of color to ask them to teach us. It's not their responsibility to correct us. We as Caucasian people must find our own error, our own sin, and our own racism and work it out with God to root it out of us. You see, the spirit is at work and we can lean in and there's enough resources for us to learn. So as you listen, as you learn, amplify voices that embody and express God's wisdom. I want to encourage you to listen to two people right now. Albert Tate, who's a pastor in California, and Esau McCauley, who's a priest in the Anglican Church. And I'll share some of their resources this week. Now, I know that as a Canadian, it's easy to look down at what's happening at the United States and to be appalled. And like many, we should be appalled by what's happening. But Canada is rife with our own problems of racism. And if we want to be a part of a better future, we need to move forward with wisdom. Seek God's wisdom. Discern how to act in the context of community and patiently apply wisdom as we seek his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Because in the new heaven and the new earth, our diversity will be celebrated and will no longer divide. 
We are not going to be colorblind, but rather we're going to be enamored with the beautiful diversity God has made within humanity. Each face and race reflecting the beauty and fullness of God. That's where we're heading. And if this is where we're going, if this is the destiny of humanity, if this is what the new humanity and the new creation looks like, let's get to work to see glimmers of it here and now, to see more and more of what's really true appearing in the present. Wisdom invites us into the way of self-giving love that counts others as more significant than ourselves. Which means that we no longer choose to sit comfortably in a system designed to benefit us. It requires us, wisdom requires us, to make decisions and to take actions that do not immediately benefit ourselves. And friends, this isn't a sprint. There's no quick fix. It's a marathon and it requires patience, but not complacency and putting what we learn into practice and partnering with people to work toward a future in which racism becomes but a memory of the past. In our hearts though, in our hearts, we have to choose a little bit of folly or the foolishness of God, the path of foolishness or the path of wisdom. And Jesus invites us to pursue his wisdom that appears foolish. And like all wisdom, it might be disregarded, but it's ultimately the wisdom of God at work to remake this broken world by remaking our broken lives. Let's pray. As we move into a time of prayer, I'll end each prayer with, Lord, in your mercy, And you can respond with, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ into the world to be our wisdom. A wisdom, quite frankly, that confounds us and surprises us. We don't expect to find God on a cross. And yet there you are crying out on behalf of humanity. Lord, reveal in each of our lives and in our community and in our nation, the ways in which we live by doing what's right in our own eyes and show us just how destructive it is. Help us to repent, to realign our our minds and our imaginations with your kingdom and to begin living as individuals and as a community and as a nation in the ways that are pleasing to you and right in your eyes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we acknowledge that we live in an age of information and that we can be overwhelmed by how much information we actually consume in a given day, a given week, a given month. Grant us discernment to not just be informed, but to be wise. To not just know a lot about the current moment, but to know what matters and by the power of your spirit to apply it to our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, help us, especially Caucasian followers of Christ, to renounce every form of racism, to renounce how we can be self-protective and defensive rather than open to dialogue and examination so that we can find better ways of living and better ways of flourishing, not just for people who look like us and act like us and think like us, but for all people. Transform us, Lord Jesus. For those of us who think we don't have anything to repent of or to change, Lord, expand our vision. Help us to see just how big and beautiful your intentions are for this world. And help us to see how far away we still are from realizing what you've come to do and what you've promised you will do at your return. Jesus, for your whole church, help us not be passive, 
but to be actively engaged with your wisdom, applying it to the challenges that we can face. And Lord, hear the cries of your people, hear the cries of those who are oppressed and come and act and establish your justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, as our Savior's taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. As our service comes to a close, I want to share a few announcements with you. If you're new to Christianity, exploring faith, or curious about who Jesus is, we invite you to try Alpha. It's a space where people come to discuss some of life's big questions in a friendly, open, and informal environment. It's for atheists, agnostics, explorers, and believers alike. Everyone is welcome. Alpha takes place online on Tuesday evenings and you can sign up at stpf.ca slash events. Throughout the centuries, Christians have engaged in the discipline of praying in the morning and evening. This practice is called the daily offices. Many people have discovered this discipline is life transforming and find that it unites them in praying with Christians throughout the centuries in the world today. Each year, we put together a helpful guide for our church to engage in the daily offices. You can download the PDF or request a printed booklet on our website at stpf.ca slash prayer. As we continue to navigate through a global pandemic, as reports of violence, racism, and oppression fill our news feeds, we're left with many emotions. What do we do with these feelings of grief, anger, frustration, and sorrow? We invite you to join us for a service of lament tomorrow evening. That's Monday, June 22nd at 7.30 p.m. This will be a time for us to come together in our sorrow, grief, and unmet longings and step into a space of spiritual and emotional stillness. We will take time to name and grieve these things together as a community. And it's also a time to look forward with yearning and expectant hearts as we await and hope for Jesus' coming. You can find the details for how to join us at stpf.ca slash events. Everything we have is a gift from God. Even in the midst of struggles, anxiety, or fear, we recognize that God is our provider. God has given us our every breath. God invites us to use our lives, our time, and our finite resources to participate in his eternal and infinite kingdom. We invite you to prayerfully consider how God is asking you to respond today. You can discover more about who Jesus is by signing up for Alpha. You can give yourself to be seen and known in relationships by signing up to join a community group or by joining the public Zoom call after the service. And you can invest financially into what God is doing in and through our church. In these uncertain times, we still hope to be a community marked by our faithfulness and generosity. If you are unable to give, please know it's okay. We are here for you, and if you're in financial need, please email us to find out more about our community support fund. If you're new to St. Pete's, please know no one asked you here for your money. We hope this service will be a gift to you. The best thing you can do is introduce yourself to us in the chat and offer your feedback after the service. 
But for those of you who call St. Pete's home or who are members of the body of Christ anywhere, you know why we give. We give back to God a small portion of what we have in response to all that God has given us. Lastly, to stay in touch with what's going on in the life of our community, please sign up for our weekly updates at stpf.ca slash loop. Finally, I wanna encourage you to continue the conversation. If you're worshiping with your community group right now, take another 15 minutes to pray and ask one another, how did God speak to you? If you're not in a group, there is an open video group you can join, which our host will post in the chat. Now, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that his ways may be known on earth and his saving power throughout every nation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in God's peace to love and serve our city. Amen.
That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. <laughs> 